In 2007, the total Sumatran elephant population was estimated to be around 2,400 to 2,800. But by 2017, that number had been reduced to less than half. And in Sumatra's Riau province, 93% of known elephant habitat is in forests where commercial and industrial activity is permitted. Palm oil, pulp and paper commodities, and even oil continue to dominate landscapes that this critically endangered charismatic mammal relies on to survive. In places like Teso Nilo National Park, 24 elephants have turned up dead over the past five years from causes ranging from poisoning to electrocution, gunshots, and snares. Their lowland habitat continues to disappear, increasing opportunities for poaching and human-elephant conflict. The way forward for their survival is daunting, but properly mounted efforts to reclaim and preserve the ecosystems they rely on still have a chance to save the Sumatran elephant. My name is Mike DiGirolamo, your host for Manga Bay Explores, a special podcast series from mangabay.com's global team, where I speak with experts from the field working to protect the critically threatened forests and animals of Sumatra. Join me bi-weekly as I dive into the unique beauty and key issues of this one-of-a-kind landscape and the people working to protect it. This week, I spoke with Manga Bay Indonesia senior writer and editor Saparia Ari Saturi and Leif Cox, founder and president of the International Elephant Project. Ari and Leif described a challenging situation exacerbated by increasingly large corporate control of so-called protected areas that once were designated for the protection of the species that inhabit them, but have continued to hold concessions for palm oil and pulp and paper commodities. And unlike some other mammals, elephants rely heavily on the lowland areas that these concessions now occupy, which have become fragmented and non-existent at best. Loose punishments for poachers throw an extra set of problems into the mix. And as is the case with many issues facing Sumatra, it can be overwhelming, perhaps demotivating. However, both Ari and Leaf stress that there are viable options and strategies which can and must be taken to save these ecosystems and the elephants that inhabit them if urgent action is taken over the next 10 years. Uh, my name is Leif Cox, and I'm the founder of the International Elephant Project. We've been working with elephant conservation for about 10 years now, um, branching off from our work with orangutans um, when we realised that some species, such as the Sumatran elephant and Sumatran tiger, were falling outside of the umbrella of orangutan conservation and required specific actions in, in order for those species to survive. Well, the most significant challenge is you, we have a, a large, um, potentially dangerous animal um, that requires large areas. But not only that, it requires the large lowland forests um, in order to survive because it can't cope um, with, and survive in highland areas. Um, very similar to the tigers and um, orangutans, but more extreme. And so what we're seeing is their habitat slowly being taken away and turning them into an agricultural pest that endangers people. And therefore we've seen their populations fragment to the level that no Sumatran elephant population is sustainable anymore. Our only hope is to manage them as a mega population actively. But even then we've got our backs against the wall because the herds have been slowly whittled away um, one by one to extinction. That wall that we now find our backs against was a process decades in the making, spurred on by monoculture concessions that have left us with few places to go in order to protect elephant herds. Over the last 20 or so years, we've seen large industrial scale unsustainable monocultures such as palm oil and pulp paper and rubber plantations um, taking up the remaining rainforest and and um, and basically displacing the elephants um, from their natural habitat and simply not giving them any place to go um, to live and to survive. While there are designated protected areas for elephants, both Ari and Leaf point out that what is stated on paper doesn't actually show up in reality, meaning that parks such as Tesonilo, while being a park, shares 500,000 hectares of its land with palm oil, pulp and paper, and oil concessions. That's a classic example where a lot of the park is actually a, a unsustainable palm oil plantation. So what's on paper and what's on reality um, is often a, a very different scenario. 
elephant is uh, very important for Indonesia because one of uh, endemic species in Indonesia. The condition become uh, worse now because uh, they lost habitat. And now, uh, as example in Riau, mostly elephant live or stay in concession area. That means companies area. That means not in protected area. Only 3% they live in protected area. To set a bit of context, in the Riau province, which is home to the second largest elephant population in Sumatra, more than 78% of its forest has been degraded or destroyed since 1982. While the province itself measures 8.7 million hectares, it saw nearly 2 million hectares of primary forest disappear between 2002 and 2019. Now, oil palm plantations cover 3.4 million hectares of this land, and timber and pulpwood plantations cover 2.4 million hectares. The ending result has pitted local villagers and elephants against each other for dwindling resources, leading to what's known as HEC, or human-elephant conflict. So the more land you take away from any species, including elephants, the less elephants can survive. Um, because they have less habitat to withdraw the resources that they need for survival. But the usual scenario is the large multinationals take um, the vast majority of the land against the unsustainable monocultures. And the elephants and the local community are pushed into smaller, smaller fragmented areas and then are competing with each other over the last remaining viable habitat for survival. And so you have local com- villages and elephants literally killing each other in order to um, survive in what's remaining as secondary forest. Along with increasing human-elephant conflict with villagers, these fragmented populations and secondary forests also increase the ease of access to poachers seeking to kill males for their tusks. Well, as the elephants have no place to hide and their uh, habitat shrinks, they become more vulnerable for two reasons. One is they're they're seeking food to survive. So they're going into villages areas um, in order to find some food and they basically then have conflict, human health and conflict with local communities as agricultural pests. But secondly, what we're seeing is criminal syndicates moving into these areas and targeting particularly the bulls who have small tusks for ivory and, and, and killing them preferentially preferentially. And so what we're actually seeing a lot of these populations is there's actually no males left the me- because the males are the ones which have been targeted by the poachers, which have more access to them now. Ari told me about Puan, a four-year-old elephant who was found trapped in a snare near a concession site in Tesonilo National Park recently. She was rescued, but later died during attempts to rehab her. They found the elephant trapped in concession near Tesonilo. They got the Tesonilo patrol, found the uh, elephant, the, and the letters they gave name Puan uh, in RAPP concession. Puan get trapped there. They brought to uh, Tesonilo and take care of Puan, but unfortunately, they cannot uh, save uh, the elephant. And then after months, the, the elephant died. Finding poisoned elephants is also not uncommon, as according to Ari, some farmers or plantation workers will actually use poison to outright kill the elephants. In addition, some use electric fences, and many elephants are found electrocuted, even shot. Especially in new plantation, if they ca- they come there and they they destroy the 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 plantation, and then the the company try to get them away, but not easy, right? So some of them uh, use poisons or they suit or they try to elephant to go away. Ari was careful to note that not all plantations are owned by companies, of course, and many times villagers themselves may incorporate some of the same tactics to keep elephants from their crops. One of cause of dead elephant is poison. By poisons, not all in company in palm oil plantation, but 
in a uh, rice field or I mean in a village. Flam oil plantation not belong to not all belong to companies, right? Some belong to uh, belong belong to villagers, some uh, company. They they are mixed, but we can see that some of them are poisonous and then get shot or they get electrocuted by an electric fence. Additionally, I spoke with Dr. Wishnu Sukmantoro of the Bogor Agricultural University about the effects of palm oil plantations in particular. Virtually all of these plantations are in some way or another traversed by elephants who are attracted to the trees. Palm oil plantations uh, is uh, very fast in Sumatra and all, all the palm oil plantations area is a uh, elephant habitat. So that like the elephant and also for the plantations is a competition with each other in particular for the immune activity inside there and so that the like the palm oil trees you know uh, the palm oil trees i think uh, the elephant is like a, uh, as a food all the areas uh, sometimes are distrust by the by the elephant yeah. because uh, elephant like the trees Many area is uh, distracted by the elephant, so that the human, the people is angry eh, for the situation. So that sometimes, like the elephant and the humans, conflicts. Eh. The head of conservation at Asia Pulp and Paper, and also a subsidiary of April, say that they regularly conduct training seminars for employees on elephant conservation, in addition to working with the BKSDA, which is a Rio conservation agency, on conducting patrols to root out snares. But it's difficult to say how much of an effect this is having on actually protecting the species from poachers or human-elephant conflict, as elephants continue to be hunted or show up killed. Ari elaborated on the criminal justice system in Sumatra, which has long been criticized for being too lenient on offenders who sometimes serve less than a year in prison for killing elephants and paying a fine of about 100 million rupees, which is the equivalent to about 7,000 US dollars. And she mentions that there are efforts to increase these sentences to a minimum of five years. So many uh, NGOs or scientists or also government talk about this, talk about that uh, punishment uh, so light. Uh, in Indonesia, we have natural resources and conservation law. If we see in the regulation, someone uh, poacher or kill the animal, they can get maximum five years and the fine 100 million. That's maximum. But in the fact, maybe only one year or less than one year, or that's that's so like. That's why government and and parliament try to uh, review the regulation and some suggestion ask government to raise the punishment at minimum, minimum five years. But until now, uh, not finished yet. Still ongoing. Even if sentences were to be increased, the fragmentation of habitats, decreased herds, and the lack of bull elephants has put repopulation efforts between a rock and a hard place. We have the, the poaching and the habitat loss and the agricultural pest human elephant conflict working together to dramatically reduce the elephant population year after year until now we're at the backs against the wall of whether we can um, save the species and allow its populations to recover to sustainable numbers. This isn't to say that there aren't conservation efforts in place, such as the Indonesian Strategic Plan for Elephant Conservation, but Leaf says that having a plan and what actually ends up being implemented are often two separate things, and there are a number of reasons why. The main thing is, I, I guess, is not the trouble with the plans as such, is their implementation. And that's the trouble with a lot of conservation all around the world, you know. It's it's to, um, what's on paper and then the reality of, of what's actually applied on the ground. And what we're seeing is there's, and this is true for conservation all around the world, we, we haven't been able to overcome the disconnect from conservation planning to re on the ground reality. Um, when it comes down to 
on the ground, we often see things which are designated as conservation forest or or is or forest is on re, in reality is not that on the ground. You know, um, you know, for example, um, one company says we've got this conservation forest and selling it as green credits. You know, um, um, but it's actually a degraded bit of land in which the local community has been forced into. And so the so-called conservation forest for the elephants in this particular situation isn't a conservation forest of all. It's a, it's a mosaic of farmland where local communities are trying to survive and the elephants and people are being forced into conflict as the elephants are, are pushed out of the plantation. Perhaps one of the biggest disconnects is the fact that a local map of a certain plot of land may be different from government to government, whereby the national government may see a land as protected and a specific local government may see it as production forest, creating a dynamic of semi-legal status for a corporation to have a plantation in an area of forest. Reconciling these differences is a problem in and of itself that Leaf says has been brought up via the One Map movement. You have multiple levels of government, um, the, the national government, the provincial government, and the local view party, the, the regional governments. And each one will have a different map and a different set of regulations. And they, they, and they don't um, coincide. So the big push um, at the moment um, to, to, is called the One Map um, Program to reconcile all the maps into one. And, and because of um, that inconsistency, it could be from a national point of view, it's a national park. But from a local government point of view, it, it's not national park. It's, it's, it's production for us and, and can be turned up. So the, um, the, the big multinationals with their you know, opaque subsidiaries, local subsidiaries, um, can take advantage of what we call maybe semi-legal status. They do have a permit you know, um, from one level of government, but, but it, it's counteracting... Um, the laws and the land use planning of a different level of government. While national parks mostly have been relegated to highland regions, large charismatic mammals like tigers, orangutans, and especially elephants rely on the lowland forests to survive, many of which are now previously logged secondary forests that have been converted into monoculture plantations. When the government no longer has any use for it, they turn it over to another commodity. When you mention national parks, one of the particular things um, which is very common, and particularly in Sumatra, national parks are created for two reasons. They're not considered useful for production forest, and secondly, for water catchment. And therefore, the national parks tend to be exclusively, um, by and large, the highland areas. And, and orangutans, tigers, and most particularly elephants, are lowland species. In fact, the elephants can't really exploit the highlands at all. And so when it comes to um, national parks, they have very little value in most cases to the Sumatran elephant. They're surviving in this previously logged secondary forest in the, in the lowlands. And that's what that area, um, because it's been logged and commercial timber license um, has often been handed in, because they don't have an opportunity to source commercial timber for up to another 50 years. And then the government has said, well, what are we going to do with it? We're not gaining income from this land anymore. The natural response is to turn it from um, logging forests to production forests and hand it over to clear felling and replacing with unsustainable monocultures from the, from the big multinationals. Um, and, of course, what we're arguing is that... Um, that um, polyculture um, under a rainforest canopy with the local community actually provides more dollars per hectare per year than unsustainable monocultures and also provides a long-term sustainable economy for Indonesia. And the, these polycultures are also compatible with maintaining the wildlife which requires those lowland areas. Leaf stresses that unless these monoculture lands are converted soon, they will blight the nutrients in the soil, rendering them unusable in the long term, leaving both environmental and economic destruction in their wake. We have to do it um, very soon because um, the nature of these unsustainable monocultures 
is they destroy the land. They take out all the micronutrients. And if you if you do try to add nutrients from another unsustainable source to keep them going, it destroys the rivers. It destroys it. Um, you have floods and you have droughts, um, reduce rainfall um, and, and the compacting of the soil. So they, they destroy the area. So the, the monoculture such as palm or hot pepper will leave an environmental wasteland behind them. The sooner that um, we realise that this is not good for the economy, not good for the people, um, we, can, we can certainly in the early years um, re- replace those with sustainable polycultures with the local communities that is compatible with wildlife and biodiversity, um, which supports the agricultural systems required for sustainability. Leaf says that polyculture crops aren't a win-win situation, however, at least not if you are including large corporations in the mix. While polyculture generates more money per hectare, that money ends up benefiting the local communities more than it would benefit the wealth of the companies that exploit the land from monoculture cropping. The, the business model of the unsustainable monoculture is take the, the money that will go to the many to the few, the money that will go to the long term forever to the short term. So it's an exploitative model. And so what we've discovered in the um, developing these um, polycultures in the rainforest is because it's very eclectic, you know, and very labour intensive, producing, you know, things like honey, um, jungle rubber, vanilla, um, shade coffee. What happens is because the intense nature of it, um, the local community gets rich and prosperous. It's actually democratizing agriculture, democratizing the economy. And so although it, it produces more money per hectare, um, it, it enriches the local community. It, it doesn't allow the big multinationals to extract the funds and the money from the local to the international, um, from the poor to the rich, from the long term to the short term. And and so it's really about saying, look, we have to not allow the billionaires to get more billions uh, to save our planet, you know, even for them, because they're not going, their children are not going to do well on a dead planet. We need to shift the agriculture um, back to, to empower the, the local communities and develop the polyculture systems that in, it, it is good for everybody. To accomplish this would require a cease and desist of monoculture expansion, which many, including LEAF, were hoping would come to pass during the COVID-19 crisis. But unfortunately, the opposite has happened. Well, I, I think the first step is, of course, to stop the, to stop the expansion. Um, and what we're unfortunately seeing is, and this is not just true with Indonesia, but all around the world, is... Of course, as conservationists, we hope that the COVID-19 could be a reset for green recovery into sustainables and rewilding 30% of the planet, which is required to actually save our planet. But um, the reverse has happened. The, you know, the invested interests have, have influenced government to actually reduce um, environmental protection you know, and increase the destruction as part of um, and increase the amount of wealth being extracted from the poor to the rich under the guise of um, economic recovery from COVID-19. And, and, and so, unfortunately, we, we, we're seeing us go in the wrong direction. You know, um, what, we, what we need to do is, is um, recognise it's better interest for everybody, one, to stop the expansion. Um, that's number one. And number two is we have to rewild the significant part of the planet um, and part of the um, the islands of Sumatra in order for it to be economically sustainable. This is ec- good economics and environmentalism are the same subject. Uh, exploitative economies um, is what we um, need to fight against. Leaf says that the way forward is actually to reclaim and rehabilitate enough concession sites so as to piece together functioning ecosystems in an attempt to rewild the landscape and give the elephants and other species a fighting chance of not just survival, but long-term rehabilitation, but that the window of opportunity to do this is only about 10 years. 
Um, what we're trying to do, and we've only got 10 years to do this, because I figure after 10 years it's going to be too late. You, you get these um, spirals of destruction. You know, for example, um, you know, the rainforest creates the rain, um, and rainforest um, reduces um, the local environmental temperatures. It also um, holds the predators, which keeps the pests at bay and the diseases at bay. And so what happens is we're seeing droughts, you know, we're seeing rivers drying up, we're seeing increased fires, and this reduces the uh, capacity of the existing rainforest to produce food for the animals. So we see this kind of spiral of extinction. Um, Similarly, just as scientists are warning with climate, you know, you you go past these tipping points. So both locally in Sumatra and globally, we've got about 10 years to turn this around. Otherwise, um, we'll see a, a... increasing spiral of destruction um, which which will run away from us and so what we're trying to do now is say the last remaining ecosystems and piece together through through various um, land use types such as ecosystem restoration concessions um, protection forests national parks to piece together enough functioning ecosystems that the orangutans, tigers and elephants can survive through the extinction crisis. Now, as I mentioned before, with elephants, there is no fantasy at the moment that we'll ever have a sustainable population of elephants. So we have three basic strategies for them. is to save habitat where herds of 120 or more can survive sustainably in those habitats, which is not enough for a sustainable population. There's many elephants which are... um, held up in small patches of the forest in, in human-dominated landscapes that need rescuing. Um, and then, uh, and because there's lots of habitat which is suitable for elephants, which are now devoid of elephants because they've been poached and killed to extinction or near extinction, just a few remaining females, maybe in some of these um, ecosystems. And then ultimately what we need to do is, and because the major human elephant conflict is these young bulls who try to leave the herd to find a new herd and they go off into the human dominate landscape and cause a lot of trouble and havoc. And so at least for the foreseeable lifetime of ourselves, we will then have to manage these, these individual populations by transferring the bulls um, from one population to another to keep them genetically sustainable, reduce the human elephant conflict and obviously bring each herd through the extinction crisis. Travel corridors have been mentioned by experts as a way to give elephants safe transport between one area to the next. And while there is importance to these, Leaf stresses that in our lifetimes, we may have to come to grips with the reality that we may have isolated, protected herds until populations and ecosystems are built enough to sustainable levels. What we really have to preferentially... um, um, be able to secure and rewild lowland forest and riverine forest. These are the key areas. Um, preserving more highland forest is okay, more forest the better, but it's not going to, to save viable ecosystems. It's a lowland riverine forest, um, which is the key habitat that we have to, to save now. Um, the, it is certainly possible in some situations to rebuild corridors for elephants to move from one area to another. And um, we're certainly um, working with the partners to try to do that in some circumstances. But I think we have to accept, at least in our lifetimes, most of the elephant population will be isolated from each other um, geographically, in, 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 you know, cut off by a sea of unsustainable monocultures. The complexity of the situation can't be overstated, but it bears clarifying. Because change is at the mercy of the speed at which it can happen, Leaf argues that by the time the necessary government and corporate reforms come to pass, it would be too late for the ecosystems and the conservationists working against the clock to save them. Corporate reforms or pledges of sustainability, Leaf says, will not do the trick here, and another approach is needed. Look, there's nothing wrong with people trying to make palm oil, as an example, less destructive. You know? um, but calling sustainable palm oil, I think, is, is not good because it actually gives the impression it's sustainable when it's not, you know, and it's not where we need to end up. Certainly less destructive palm oil is, is certainly a, a good thing. 
Um, but, you know, I don't think we should be calling it sustainable because that's not what the science is telling us, you know. Um, secondly, it's all over the world we've, we've, we've lost control of our democracies to big businesses. You know, governments, you know, um, are, will act in the interest of the funders, not on the interest of the voters. That's just happening all around the world. So it's very hard to, um, to get government action, you know, where they're, where they're hamstrung. In particular, developing nations such as Indonesia, um, born into debt, you know, when they were um, created after World War II, um, tend to be very much um, in the grips of the multinationals. You know, um, you know, Indonesia tried to um, get out of the grips of the multinationals and, of course, in 1965, one million Indonesians were killed in a military coup. You know, so it's just not that easy for us to sit here and go, Oh, you know, you should just become, you know, the best interest is not corrupt. There's huge um, forces, you know, um, and even good people in government can't act um, because of these the, the political um, and economic constraints which are put on them not only inside the country but from outside. And so I often um, reel against the criticism, you know, of Indonesia as, you know, as being um, silly or, or corrupt, you know, whether it's actually part of a bigger system, you know, which we, we, in some ways you can see the Indonesian Indonesian as a victim of it, you know, not a, a perpetrator of the system. And so I, I always reel against, you know, this um, just this blanket criticism of, of Indonesian, Indonesian government, you know, and there's some wonderful people, you know, actually trying to do wonderful things. But the answer to your question, what can we do? I believe that um, attacking one particular product, such as palm oil, is not the way to go because there's many other equally profitable or, at, at, or almost equally as profitable unstable monocultures that a businessman can replace. He can put pulp paper on it, he can put rubber, he can put sugar palm. And so you can ban all pine oil tomorrow. It's not going to stop them from destroying the forest for the value of the trees and replacing it with another unstable monoculture. So, so attacking one product may make us feel good, but it's not going to save a tree. Similarly, um, attacking a company is very hard because it's extremely opaque and they're greenwashing, you know, such as um, Asian pop or paper is just so advanced, you know, um, and they're so good at it so many years. Um, and also, in the end, um, if a land is designated a production forest and the company refuses to knock down the forest, all the government would do is go, OK, you're not using the land for the purpose for which the permit was issued. We revoke the license and give it to another company. So you can make every co- you can make these big companies, each of them sustainable, but the rainforest will still disappear because you're not addressing the, the land use planning. And so th- these things just simply don't work. So what we de- decided that works, and we, we're demonstrating this in the areas that we're supporting, is you look at each ecosystem and you work out a land use plan of how to get this ecosystem to have, have the right type, shape and size of rainforest to make it sustainable. And then you work with the local partners, government businesses, local communities, and you ask for specific things, you know. Um, can you please give this concession to this company of the and Restoration Concession to restore it? This company, can you give up this corridor and this area as, and reforest it as a buffer zone to the national park? Indigenous communities, can you... Um, move your agricultural system from a slash and burn agricultural system, which was sustainable when they had enough land, but multinationals have taken most of it, move it to the agricultural systems that can survive on the rainforest canopy so you can prosper yeah, and and, and um, get a good living out of the forest while we're restoring the ecosystem. So it's basically like a doctor, you look at each ecosystem, diagnose the disease and prescribe the right medicine and the right dosage. So these big picture um, strategies of banning palm oil or going sustainable palm oil or whatever, they're, they're, they're too big. You know, they, 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 they're a blunt instrument that always fails to address the specific diseases 
which are affecting each ecosystem. One might wonder how this could be achieved, and Leaf suggests that instead of corporations making pledges of sustainability, that we then ask them to give up very specific plots of land which could then be rewilded, and getting local governments to be in on the effort at a local level. Now, the roadblocks, is, like, as I said, it, it, it's, it's at the micro level. So it's whether um, you know, we can convince a company to, to, to give up the land. You know, and, and therefore, um, in, in some ways, we have to give up this idea as we, you know, of these big sustainable pledges and all this sort of stuff and, you know, and get together and ask for very specific actions from a company. You know, we, you know, um, so, so um, International Health Project isn't a, camp, isn't a um, campaign organization, but instead of campaign organizing, let's say going, OK, we want the company to have a sustainable pledge you know, to not destroy the forest by 2025. Of course, by 2025, the pledge is 2030, as you know. I've been seeing these rolling pledges of sustainability <laughs> and that, you know, f- for the, my whole career. And so, but, you know, get it down to it, you know, where you can't move. You know, we're monitoring this, this patch of land. What we're, what conservation is required from you if you want us, you know, to support your business, you know, enabled to to go forward is to give up these specific lands to reforest these specific areas what we want from the government is is, is you know not um, um large pledges i mean you know governments are and even in the Indonesian government is always one they're always very progressive at signing you know and um, climate change and environmental deals you know they're they're ahead of the game um far far um more ahead of the game than countries such as um, America and, and Australia, but they but they lack the ability to apply that down at the Pacific level where we need to make those requests. It, no, it was well, a very it's a very difficult system. I mean, as I said, we, we've all um, in all our countries have lost our democracies to, um, to to big businesses, you know, and so um, that's why I don't believe. I mean, we we can all dream about a more democratic future, you know, um, and and economy is not rigged against the poor, you know, uh, and, and we should all work for that in um, in our own countries and, and our own um, lives as we, as we vote and, and try to make a difference. Um, but it really doesn't seem to um, be anything we can achieve in a 10-year timeline which we need to turn this around. And it's a timeline that LEAF and other conservationists implore the world to take seriously. But while it may seem depressing, it is not beyond hope of achieving. And by supporting organizations who are working on the ground to push these efforts forward, any individual can have a measurable contribution. One of the things is, is, and what I've found is over um, talking a lot over conservation, I've been turning people off conservation for 20, 30 years. Because your natural reaction to our discussion could be, it's too late, let's give up, it's too hard. Honestly, this guy later depressing me. You know, I really need to switch on another channel. Um, but we, we can do this. You know, uh, we have a strategy to save five to eight complete ecosystems, and we have a strategy. Um, we've already um, supporting um, elephant reintroduction in Laos, which has been shown to be successful. We've we've, we've um, supported the um, transfer of elephants from a rogue elephant from one pop, from one area into an area where there's only four females left and he's staying there and starting to reproduce. Um, we're showing um, with our um, PT companies um, applying and getting ecosystem restoration concessions. We can work, work with local community. So um, by supporting organisations that are, are, are strategically working on the ground, to save these complete ecosystems before it's too late, we can all make a meaningful change. And therefore, we should feel empowered, you know, um, that there is a crisis, there is an urgent need to act, um, but we do have the power to turn this around. I asked Leif, Ari, and Dr. Sukman Toro, what makes the Sumatran elephant so special? And their responses highlighted not just the beauty of this animal, but also its connection to us as humans, and a reflection of our own humanity in the way we treat them, which Leaf argues makes it not just a conservation issue, 
but a humanitarian one? Um, it's the smallest of the remaining elephants, um, except for the, the, the obviously the Bornean pygmy elephant. Um, and it's this it's, it's unique, um, beautiful animal, you know. Um, and we're slowly destroying the megafauna of our planet. Um, but more importantly for me um, is the self-aware persons, just as humans are, highly intelligent, social, they recognize their own individual existence and, and they suffer and they mourn, you know, um, just as we do. So the killing of these elephants and the destruction of the herds and the huge stress that they're under is not only a conservation issue, it's a humanitarian issue because their destruction and death is an individual story of horror. One by one, every week an elephant has been poisoned or killed or and caught in the trap, and you know the um, the at least their own their humanity as a non-human person also needs to be recognised, as well as the fact that they're from a critically endangered species um, that deserve the right to survive. I want to thank Ari for her contributions and research on the Sumatran elephant, and to Leaf for his expertise and his advocacy at the International Elephant Project, and to Dr. Sukman Toro for contributing to this episode. Mangabe Explores is an ongoing podcast series diving into environmental stories from around the globe. Be sure to check out the previous episode in this series, which covers the proposed Sumatran Highway Project and its implications for the Sumatran Tiger. Watch for a new edition of Mangabe Explores every two weeks in between episodes of our flagship podcast, The Mangabe Newscast. Special projects like these are made possible by our Patreon supporters. Download our new app for Apple and Android devices to gain fingertip access to all our new shows and all our previous episodes. We also ask that if you enjoyed this show, please tell a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. As we enter the new year, Mongabay is asking you to invest in journalism that matters. Your support powers our reporting, which informs decisions supportive of a sustainable future and provides training for over 750 global journalists. Please support Mongabay at mongabay.org forward slash donate. Again, that's mongabay.org forward slash donate. Keep up with all of Mongabay's news from Nature's Frontline at mongabay.com or get updates via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is at mongabay. Thank you once again, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Mongabay Explorers.